Jeffrey Riddick, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. How about you, Glenn? I'm doing very well. Hey, thanks for taking the time to sit down and chat with me. Of course. No, I'm so excited. Um, I want to steal all your background <laughs> posters, and I want your Stormtrooper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's actually pretty cheap. <laughs> um, hey, look, even though your your new film is um, it's called Don't Look Back, I'd like to quickly look back, if I can, just to give our, give our <laughs> listeners a little bit of context to your work. Some people down here might not know your work, but... um. You are, of course, best known as you know one of the creators or the creator of the Final Destination uh, franchise. Um, and as a writer and or producer, you also lay claim to movies like Tamara and Dead Awake and The Call, amongst others. Now, firstly, you're pretty much the reason why a lot of us avoid um, trucks when we're on the road. Trucks, you know, trucks. I knew you were going to yeah. say that in some planes. Yes. Um, and I look at it like I've saved lives, maybe. Um, as opposed to traumatizing people. Um, But that idea came when we were doing the second movie, we were trying to think of a good opening. And I'm from Kentucky, which is like hill country here in America. And um, there's always log trucks. And every time I get behind one, I pull into the next lane. And we couldn't figure out the right opening. Um, Originally, it was going to be a hotel fire. And the producer's like, no, it needs to be something a little bit stronger. And I got behind a log truck and I pulled over and then I just pulled off the road and I called the producer and I'm like, what about a lot? And he's like, slow down. I can't understand. You. I'm like, well, what about a log truck on a freeway and the chain breaks and he's like, that's it. And, um, yeah. So it was, it's, that's one of the best parts of, of working with creative people and, you know, just being, you know, cause stuff in life just influences you. And that's the biggest, you know, that's the scene that most people, I still get log truck memes and they're like, we're, sure you're sick of getting those. I was like, no, they feed my soul. Send me more. <laughs> as long as no one was hurt. As long as no one was hurt in an accident. I don't want to hear about actual people getting hurt, but you can send me all the other memes you want. <laughs> uh, well, I, I live on like a, a, a logging highway, so I think about your work every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in your brain. <laughs> you are. And, and speaking of Kentucky, um, our show has a close connection with Kentucky because the Bonehead Weekly podcast are weekly contributors to our show. They are, oh, they do a short segment and you were actually on their, one of their episodes about a year yes. ago. And the thing is, aside from that interview, I've avoided pretty much every other piece of media of you in lead up to this interview because I wanted to come into it as fresh as possible. Oh. Having having said that, I am sure you get asked the same shit all the time, so I apologize if that's... Oh, don't apologize. I don't, yeah, no, I don't care. <laughs> Ask me whatever okay. you want. <laughs> in that case, how reliable is Wikipedia or IMDb in telling your story of how you got involved with Bob Shea and New Line? Um, it's spot on, yeah. Um, it's a pretty... Fu- Do you want me to tell it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for oh, it. Oh, yeah. No, it's 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 absolutely accurate. Um, when I was fourteen, I saw the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie, and it's still my favorite movie today. But um, I went home, you know, I was a little hillbilly, didn't know anything about the movie business, and I banged out a prequel, and it was bad looking back because I was fourteen. Mm-hmm. But I s- sent it to Bob Shea, who ran New Line Cinema, and he sent it back because it w- he said we don't take unsolicited work, and I didn't know what unsolicited meant because I was only fourteen, so I had to look it up. But then I wrote him back and I'm like, look, sir, I've spent $3 on your movies. I think you can take five minutes to read my story. And he actually read it and he got back in touch with me. And after that, him and his assistant, Joy Mann, who isn't with us any longer, unfortunately, but wonderful woman, they stayed in touch with me from age 14 to 19. They would send me scripts, you know, so I got to read scripts and learn formatting and learn structure. They'd send me posters and like, you know, little trinkets and tchotchkes from movies and then when I was 19 I went to New York to study acting and I ended up interning at New Line Cinema um Joy and Bob brought me on as an intern and I just stayed (laughs) I just didn't leave um that's amazing that that right there alone will instantly catch the attention of our listeners I'm sure (laughs) no it's 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 a great story and it, it I think it happened at the right time too because New Line was Nightmare on Elm Street blew New Line up, but they were still small enough that Bob would take the time out of his schedule to like respond to somebody, you know, yeah. with a letter. Um, I keep sometimes when I tell that story, I say email just because I keep forgetting um, that <laughs> we did. <laughs> well, a lot of uh, a lot of fans call New Line the house that Freddie built. Is that something yeah. that was that like a moniker they had? 
Yeah, I mean, they they knew it. I mean, Freddie, the, the thing is, Bob had, had worked really hard to build New Line, but he took a chance on Nightmare on Elm Street because, you know, every other studio passed on it. And it became a huge hit for them. So once mm. once they got a few sequels in and started building their capital, then they started making other, like, amazing movies. But um, New Line, you know, Bob was very, you know, reverential to how important Nightmare on Elm Street was to the company. And, and yeah, even in-house, they would call it the house that Freddie built. So it wasn't, yeah. it, you know, everybody knows, you know, That's knew fantastic. how important that's yeah. fantastic. So I wanted to get that out of the way, just you know, for people to listen in that might not know your name. Now they know who you are, so that's good. And um, that brings me to "Don't Look Back." So you adapted this from a short film that you had made um, called "Good Samaritan." Um, can you give our listeners a brief rundown of what the film is about? Yeah, um, the film is about a group of people who witness somebody getting assaulted in a park and don't help, and one of the people films it and, and it goes viral. And then somebody or something starts coming after the witnesses. And it's more, it's, it, you know, I love, horror is like my jam. Straight up horror is my jam. Everything I do is straight up horror. But this was the first film that I wrote where I wanted to play with it, making it more of a mystery, you know, like, so you don't know if it's a killer. Um, so it's more of a mystery than a straight up horror film. Um, and I only say that because a lot of fans going in expecting Final Destination and like, you know, the gruesome set pieces and stuff because we don't know who or what the killer is, there's not a lot of gruesome, uh, awesome deaths in it. There's some cool, cool twists and turns, but, um, but yeah, it was a really fun project to make. Um, I actually took the character from the film who shot the video and wrote a different story for him for the short film, Good Samaritan. So you can find this short on online, but with the short, I went straight up supernatural um, this isn't spoiling the movie because I, it's not spoiling it either anything, but I wanted to just show that I could direct horror because people were like, we need to see something. Um, so I, I went with a complete supernatural. So if you watch that first, don't expect that to be the movie <laughs> because yeah. it's, it, it's not the movie, but it's a really fun short. Yeah. And, sure. um, and I got, um, you know, rain Wilson's in it, but I think the happiest that I am is that I, got Jane, but I, I can't, you may not be old enough, um, but Jane Badler, who was in the original V miniseries, who played Diana, the evil lizard. Um, she's like, she's like my, V is like my TV, like <laughs> thing and Nightmare on Elm Street's like my movie thing. Um, and I reached out to her and she lives in Australia. She lives in Australia and, um, and um, asked her if she would be in the short. And she's like, I'll do it. You don't have to pay me. It was only a couple of lines. And, but she's like, I'm in Australia, so you'll have to get somebody. So I found somebody to shoot her. And she, for, for just like a line or two, she sent me back so many takes at so many different locations. I'm like, with outfit changes, she was so amazing. And um, we've become friends since then. And um, But yeah, she, she lives there now, and um, she's just wonderful. So I geek out about her being in the short. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's fantastic. I love it when you, you get to work with these people that you've idolized for so long. And, yeah, um, and, yeah. And you mentioned that Rain Wilson is in it. He reprises his role from the short. Was that new footage in the film? Um, we we used his footage from the short in the film. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we had to ask, you know, we got permission from it. He, t he told us that we could do it. So um, it, it just really helped, you know, because it fits, it still fits the story. Um, and I didn't want to try to have to arrange like, reshooting him just for the you know for the part that he has in the film which is you know kind of a newscaster talking about what happened um well if that's the case like that's really impressive because i think you've used a lot of footage that wasn't in the short you could you know you could say that it's sort of it is new because i i've watched both and i remember things that were in the film were not necessarily in the short, so yeah. perhaps it was just you know different angles, or but I'm pretty sure it was dialogue no. as well. Yeah, yeah. we and, just used that, frame footage. Yeah, yeah, and and his um and his footage was shot meticulously as well. It's really like pops. Yeah, yeah. No, it it was um he's a he's a somebody who I also you know I hate saying friend because then it sounds like I'm a douchebag, but <laughs> I'm not trying to be respect. But he's a friend of mine too, and he's he's he was just so gracious to work with and. He's just such an awesome guy too. So um, he was actually you know. in one of the one of the movies that Bob Shea directed, The Last Mimsy. Is that sort of how you knew him yeah. through Bob? 
Uh, no, I know him. Um, we're both Baha'is, so we we go to the same. We we don't have like technical church, but we basically go to the same church. So I met him through that through church first um, before I knew he was Rain Wilson because um, I didn't watch The Office. I have watched it then. Once I once I knew he met him and knew he was in it, but I didn't watch it at the beginning. So um, he's just a really good guy, and um, so it was great to have him be in the short. I mean, be in the feature. Um, but you know, what was really exciting too is because we we had gone the studio route, and then the, the studio that was going to film it shut their film division down like a week before we were starting to. We were supposed to fly down to start pre pre production. So the producer on it just decided that we let's just do this independent because if we you know we can wait you know we you can wait in the studio system for ever. <laughs> so we shot it on a on a on a very low budget, and um, I was able to kind of cast people that I wanted to cast. So I was really particularly excited about, you know, casting Courtney Bell as Caitlin in the film. Um, I had a hard time at a bigger budget level because they didn't want me casting a woman of color in the lead. And I thought she was the best actress. And it's like, you know, I got to cast her. And I think she's amazing in the film. I think we have a great cast all the way around. I mean, I love all of our cast, but, you know, just as a filmmaker who's who's been trying since since the first Final Destination to get some diversity in the movies that they keep making that I write. Um, it was very nice just to be able to have a, you know, a really strong black female character, you know, in a genre film. Absolutely. And on top of that, I think the, the thing that really uh, resonated with me the most watching it was that it is a social commentary on where we've come to as a society, uh, especially with the social media landscape and all that. Um, and I think the sticking point of the film for me is that it kind of, turns the story on the viewer and sort of has us questioning what we would do in those situations you know yeah. how long had, how long had that idea been with you where did the where did the seed come from um the seed came from this story about a woman named kitty genovese um who in new york i think it was new york um she was assaulted in her the courtyard of her apartment and the story at the time was that you know, 23 people like watched and her, it was a horrific assault. It lasted for a long time. The killer went away, came back, then assaulted her again and killed her. Um, so that story has always stuck with me. Um, and I've been in a couple of situations where one time I butted my nose into a guy who was like screaming and it was about to smack his girlfriend and I intervened and he kicked me in the nuts, which was a really manly thing to do. Um, but, you know, I think we've all been in situations where we wondered, you know, can I help? And, and, and it's not like I expect people to put themselves in je physical jeopardy, but I think what's happened, like you said, with social media is people's first instinct now is to start recording it. Like, and they have a phone, they don't call 911 and then record it. They just start recording. And that's where, that's where, you know, I think this has gotten more relevant over the years because it's, it's just a weird commentary on where we are as a society where I think it's, we're, a lot of people, it's not everybody, but your first instinct is to record as opposed to call 911, you know, and get help. And, yep. you know, it's, there's this kind of search for, and this movie, the movie, this movie doesn't get into that angle of it, but there, I think there's a search for like, I want to become, I want something to go viral. So I'm going to re record whatever I can find that's awful that I think will go viral. Um, and we've yeah, lost, definitely. I think we have lost empathy. People have just lost empathy for each other. Um, yeah, couldn't yeah. agree more. I think your, your film is sort of hit at the right time. Yeah. Um, and, and with that, I think, you know, like it is just an interesting concept within itself, but for fans of, you know, genre, it, it's not that far removed from Final Destination and some of those classic, you know, 80s and 90s slashes. Did you have it in mind to sort of follow that structure or was that just something that, that you were led to naturally? Um, I didn't do it on purpose, uh, but... If you have a group of people, it, something happens to a group of people and then something or someone starts coming after them, it's going to get compared to Final Destination. Um, so I, I, tr I tried and there's one scene where I have a character backing up towards the street that I was going to pay an homage to because I knew people were going to go in expecting Final Destination where you think maybe a bus is going to hit the character, but it, it, I, I didn't edit it that way. I was like, ah, I don't, you know. If I if I can't live up to Final Destination and I'm not trying to, I don't want to get 
final destination in too many people's heads. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, Jeffrey, look, all, all good things must come to an end. We are just about out of time, but I could chat with you for ages about all things horror and your work. And, and I'm always around, so you can always you can reach Excellent. out. Yeah. Excellent. Um, the, the movie is Don't Look Back, and it is released through our good friends in Australia through Eagle Entertainment. And uh, for people listening and, uh, and even watching, uh, there are copies to be won on our social media pages. So uh, over the next few days, keep your eyes on that. But for now, thanks so much for hanging out, yeah. mate. It's been real fun. Of course. Of course. Thank you, Glenn. Video of the assault in Bristol Park. Several bystanders stood by and just watched a man get beaten to death. Sir, wait, you can't go in there. Are you arresting them? They didn't break any laws. They like, let my brother die. Catch the guy who did this. How can you look at yourselves? I don't think he killed himself. There's no evidence anyone else was inside in his apartment. It's not a coincidence. It's karma. What if she's right? Caitlin. I felt something. It's just a coincidence. Karma is a force. Which means it can use people but it can also use things. What the hell? The death of the Good Samaritan. <gasps> Have you guys experienced anything weird? A presence? I told the cops everything I know. Well, we've got everyone working this case. We haven't caught the guy. Forensics is running the DNA. I'm just a little worried. He's out there, and now he knows who we are. You have a habit of turning up when people die. One time I can write off as coincidence. Twice I get suspicious. Three times? Well, no one's that unlucky.